My husband and I left Target late one night, and since it was winter time in Chicago, my husband was fine with me getting in the car to warm up while he loaded the back with our random assortment of Target goods. The parking lot was relatively empty except for the car parked directly in front of us. I look at the car and notice a man sitting in the driver's seat. Not wanting to stare, I look away, but then stop. I look back at him again and I get chills all over. My husband finally slides into the car and I say, this guy in front of us, do you see this? He looks, goes pale, and says, what the hell? He's not looking at us, he's not looking at anything. His eyes are so sunken in, they look like black voids. His mouth is agape, like he's sleeping, but it's just a black hole. No teeth or tongue. Now, this might just be due to obscured vision, since it was nighttime, but we were right under a light, so he was fairly illuminated. The creepiest part was his skin. Think the cockroach alien from Men in Black when he's in that guy's body. Some places of the face were hanging off, others were stretched tight. He looked like a thing wearing a human face. He wasn't moving, just breathing. Let's get the hell out of here, my husband said, obviously startled. We pulled out of there as quick as we could and triple checked the locks on our doors that night. We still get creeped out remembering that night. My husband is a huge skeptic and doesn't believe in the paranormal or anything outlandish, but even he knows that there was something unexplainable about that guy. He just didn't look human. A notorious murderer in my city was actually a security guard at the company where I worked before he was identified and caught. After he was apprehended, we discovered that he had kept the body of a small child in a cold water tank on the premises, just a few yards away from where we worked. It had been there two years or so, but was never found or even suspected until he had given the information to police. The man is still in jail nearly 25 years later. It has since been proven with DNA that he was actually responsible for several area murders. He is serving compound life sentences. He actually was very friendly with me and with my colleagues. As we came in and out of the building every day, he smiled and joked with everyone. In fact, the two of us had an ongoing morning gag. While he still worked there, and well before his crimes were discovered, my baby daughter was born. My wife and I brought her into the office to show her off one day. I let this security guard, who was the father of an eight-year-old himself, hold my baby. As the body of a toddler he murdered a few months before lay decomposing a couple of rooms away. There used to be an old abandoned school in a town by my house. It was heavily boarded up and super hard to get into. A friend and I managed to get inside once by climbing up the side of the school via a pipe and a fire escape combo and slipping through a window on the roof. We explored the basement, which was flooded. It was really creepy seeing stairs that disappear into water. We had just left the gym when we heard footsteps coming from the doors on the other side of the gym. Scary, especially considering it sounded like it was one person. 
Not another group of explorers, like us. Whoever it was was blocking our exit back up to the roof. The only way out otherwise was behind us through boarded up doors. Whoever it was sounded like they were walking around and stopping periodically. There was no light coming from that direction, and we couldn't fathom why someone would come into a creepy place like this, alone. We waited for the footsteps to stop, and then snuck across the gym, peered down the hallways, saw no one, and continued towards the stairs, which would lead us back to the roof. Halfway down the hall, we hear someone sprinting towards us from behind, probably 50 meters away or so, down a typical high school hallway. Now, it is mostly dark in here, but there was a small amount of light coming in through the cracks in the window boards. Still, we didn't see anything behind us as we quickly ran up the stairs. We didn't stop until we got back to the fourth floor. We listened for noise. Nothing. We hopped out the window and climbed back down the pipe. In 2004, I moved out of my parents' house into a very small, one-bedroom apartment. It wasn't in the best neighborhood, but it was all I could afford at the time. A few months after I moved in, I woke up in the middle of the night to a voice on the other side of my bedroom door. Someone was there, in the hallway, in the dark and they were whispering my name over and over. The scariest part of this was that whoever it was stood in the dark hallway to my apartment and whispered my name for hours. My cell phone was on my kitchen counter charging. I sat there for hours, helpless and beyond scared. One night, when I was around 12 years old, something under my bed kept tugging on my sheets and eventually fully pulled them under my bed. I sat up all night, scared shitless. I checked under the bed in the morning and my sheets were balled up under the foot of my bed. I live in Stuttgart and was walking across an open area that used to be a parade area. Just kind of a wide open field. My head was down and I was looking at some of the leaves on the ground when off to my left I heard, How are you doing? I looked over assuming I was going to see someone I knew, but it wasn't. When I looked over I saw a small person about four feet tall. I say person because I still don't know if it was a man or a woman, child or adult. But more than anything, the clothes are what really threw me. The clothes looked as though they were made by someone who had never seen clothes before. That's the only way I can describe it. I answered, but I quickly looked away from the person. I started to walk away, but then I stopped. I thought to myself, you need to turn around and figure this out. Well, I turned around to an empty field. I have no idea where this person went since I only walked a few steps. I have no idea what I saw and actually thought that I had a full-on hallucination. Nothing like that has ever happened to me before, but it was definitely the oddest thing that's ever happened to me.
About two years ago, me and a buddy decided to go on a drive. It was a hot summer's night, and we were bored out of our minds. So we picked up some cigarettes and went on a late night drive. We decided to drive to the top of the mountain. The base of the mountain is about an hour's drive from where I lived, and it takes about another hour to drive all the way to the top where they have a restaurant and a bar. It was pretty late, around 3 a.m. in the morning. We knew the bar would be closed, but we thought we would just chill on the benches, have a smoke, and take in the view at first light. So we get to the base of the mountain and start driving up and around. The road twists around the mountain until you get to the top. So when you reach a turn, you can barely see around the corner. It was pitch black darkness. Only the road was visible due to the street lights. But apart from the road, the edges and the mountainside were barely visible. We had been driving for about half an hour. Everything was pretty enjoyable. Absolutely empty roads, complete silence. It was just very relaxing. As we turn one of the bends, I get this very uneasy feeling as I see something, definitely a person, sitting on a boulder at the edge of the road. My friend sees this as well, but keeps driving, but I realize that he is turning the car around and going back because it's pretty treacherous to reverse on that road. So we head back, slowly and I realize that he is fine. He's not getting any bad feelings. He is in a normal mood. So I convinced myself that I'm acting weird. We park the car opposite of this figure, the engine still running, and my friend calls out, uh, hi there, are you okay? I have to admit, I was still pretty scared, so I didn't say anything. No response. The figure then looks up in our direction, and we see that it's a woman wearing a plain white dress with very long, beautiful hair, but her face was three times the length of a normal person's face. Her eyes were completely blank, and she had a smile on her face. I swear, we both felt so fearful that we were completely paralyzed. We couldn't yell or even communicate, not even a single word. It felt like we couldn't move. I don't know how he found the courage to press the gas and get the hell out of there, but I do remember that when we got home, we had a very high fever, and we were both like that for a couple more days afterwards. One night, I was in bed, getting ready to go to sleep. I was around 17 years old, living in my parents' basement. I heard someone open the basement door and start walking down the steps. It sounded like they were wearing flip-flops, which was odd because it was fairly cold outside at the time. They came down the steps and then stopped. I thought it might be my brother, but he was out with his friends, and he never wore flip-flops. I called out anyway. Jake, is that you? No answer. Flip-flop, flip-flop, flip-flop. Walking toward my door. Dad? Mom? No answer. The knob on my door started to move. No dice. It's locked. There was an audible, disappointed sigh, and then... Flip-flop, flip-flop, flip-flop. Away from my door and back up the steps. I was straight up scared as hell. I grabbed a baseball bat and went out to the living room dividing the bedrooms. Nothing. No one in the bathroom. No one in my brother's room. No one on the steps. We had two phone lines at that house, 
so I called my parents' line. Dad, did you see headlights come up the driveway or hear anyone come in the house? He hadn't. Did you or mom just come downstairs? Wearing flip-flops? What? No, go back to bed, son. So I did. Eventually. I thought someone had snuck into our house. It was the most genuinely terrified I had ever been. Following a trail through the snowy woods on a cold winter night, suddenly the strong scent of a woman's perfume. Just in one particular spot, I was past it before it really registered. That's odd, I thought. I stepped back. Yes, I could smell it. I took another step, and the smell was gone. When I stood in one particular spot, I could smell it. But one step either way, there was nothing. And the trail did not intersect with another. I stepped off the trail into the deep snow. And sure enough, no scent to the left or the right. The night was still. No wind. A chill went down my spine. By this time, I was looking around to see if maybe someone was hurt off the trail or even if there was a body nearby. I called out. No response. I called again, listening carefully, and I stood there, wondering what to do. And then I carried on, with my hair standing up on my neck, looking back over my shoulder. You know what? I just realized I had never looked up into the trees. I like primitive camping, and me and my wife go out sometimes by ourselves. We usually bring the dog and spend a couple nights. This time we invited some friends for drinking shenanigans. On the first day, we heard a vehicle coming down the road. Not odd, but there are maybe ten more sites on this several miles of road. It's a dirt road with nothing there but these primitive sites. One way in, one way out. What is odd, though, is that the vehicle was a meatpacking truck. It was old, really old, and all the lettering on the side of the truck was faded or gone. It was this fading beige and decrepit. None of us actually saw the person driving it, but there were no tags or plates on the back at all. So we all get creeped out, but collectively kind of decide. It wasn't as weird as we thought, and we get back to enjoying our night. Flash forward to the next morning. My mom calls. She is panicking, freaking out. Apparently, some hikers were abducted near us. There are several girls at our site, including my wife, and she is convinced it was them. I wanted to know how near, so I pulled up my GPS and an article I found about it with their last known locations. It was about a half a mile away from where we were. I legitimately don't remember what happened after that, but I'm scouring the news from those years and it's hard to find an article. I want to say they found one of the girls tied to a tree. Apparently, there are quite a lot of people abducted and murdered on and near the parkway. I'm pretty sure that the man driving that truck was never found. This past summer, I was working on a project monitoring amphibian larvae. Many of them were in the middle of wide expanses of state land, largely unpatrolled. Technically, 
with no public access, but plenty of old logging roads and ATV trails people don't usually use for poetic strolls at sunrise, through nature, or bird watching. I stumbled onto a lot of illegal dumps with weird things. Sofas, construction equipment, hundreds of chew cans, baby clothes, not to mention plenty of abandoned camps and hangouts for people to shoot up, plenty of disposed paraphernalia. But without a doubt, the creepiest thing I ever found while I was alone about five miles from a paved road following only deer trails was an upright, gently used baby stroller. There were toys in the storage areas and a blanket still in the main area. I just stood there and stared at it, like at any moment something would step out of the woods at me. I was hiking through a set of old train tunnels in Colorado with another female friend when we got to the last and longest train tunnel. We both got this horrible feeling that we were being watched. We entered the tunnel and began walking toward the other side. We kept hearing strange echoes and noises, but we both nervously laughed it off. We had one flashlight between us and at the middle of the tunnel, it started to die. Right before it went out, we saw this really creepy, white, faceless man-sized doll. It had been stabbed repeatedly in the face, and white stuffing was leaking out. We heard loud shuffling behind us. The light went out. We hauled ass and ran to the end of the tunnel. On the way back, we took an alternate route. Neither of us ever went back to that trail. When I was a kid in the mid-90s, my friends and I were hiking around the woods behind our house on some timber property and we found an abandoned farmhouse. The weird thing was that the house had been left very suddenly. There was still unopened mail and magazines sitting on the coffee table, all dated back to the 1950s. The sheets and blankets were still on the beds, clothes still in the drawers, a pantry full of canned and jarred food. Half of it exploded or was leaking after so many years. There was dishes in the sink dishes on the table, unburned candles still sitting, waiting to be used, a refrigerator outside full of food that had turned to muck and dust. After exploring the house for a while, we checked out the farm. The chicken coop had dozens of chicken skeletons. There were two pig skeletons in a pen and the remains of a horse and several cows in the surrounding pasture. It didn't occur to me as a kid at the time, but aside from the house having been left so suddenly, it was really remarkable that the entire place was undisturbed. There was no vandalism, no sign of entry, and as far as I could tell, we were the first people to set foot there in 40 years. I watched security cameras for a transport company in Detroit. It was roughly 2 a.m. I'm watching the cameras and notice a woman in a nightgown standing at the end of the driveway. The facility is fenced and gated. I kept an eye on her and she stood there for about five minutes, not moving, just kind of swaying back and forth. There weren't too many people working that late, 
but I let everyone at the facility know that there was a woman standing outside of the gate. One driver decided that he needed to hit the road. When he exited the gate, the woman walked in front of the truck, blocking him. I immediately phoned the police. He blared his horn, and then she rushed to the side of his truck and attempted to open his door aggressively. He sped away, leaving her standing there. She continued to stand there in one place, not moving, for about 10 minutes. She eventually walked away, never to be seen by us again. The police never showed up. My work has me walking and running around the whole plant all shift. We usually cover around 12 to 16 kilometers on a good day. Combine this with Ontario's negative 30 degrees Celsius winters and a deadly crosswind caused by open shipping doors makes for a pretty rough shift. I was close to death four hours into my shift, so my coworker told me that she'd cover me while I went and took a quick nap in my car. I parked in the assembly plant's parking lot across the street from ours so the supervisor couldn't see me. No more than 15 minutes into my 3 a.m. nap, I was startled awake by someone tapping on my window. Looking around, the parking lot was deserted. Whoever woke me must have either ran away in the seconds it took me to open my eyes or evaporated. I decided to head back to work and I told my coworker about what happened. Her response, oh yeah, that happens all the time with everyone working the night shift. We don't know who it is doing it. I haven't taken a nap in the parking lot since. I pulled over for a break on the way to Melbourne from Sydney at a truck stop. There were no street lights or anything. It was pitch black. No other trucks or cars at this stop. I turned off my lights. I switched the truck off. I pulled the curtains. I locked the truck from both sides and jump into bed. I set my alarm and set my phone above me in the compartment. I was rolling over from side to side for about 15 to 10 minutes. I couldn't get to sleep due to it being prime summer temperatures. I'm looking up at the ceiling, mentally planning out the day ahead. Suddenly, the passenger side door opens up slightly and the cabin light turns on. What the hell? Now, the truck is fairly a late model and in pristine condition, so there's no question about the door being faulty or anything like that. I sat there for what felt like an eternity, expecting someone to come up and see me sitting there with the solid rod in my hand that we use for tightening belts. No one came up, nor was there any noise at all. Just quiet, eerie silence. I grabbed my torch and jumped down and walked around the truck. No other trucks were around, nor were there any cars. It was just me and my fully loaded B-double. After around five to ten minutes of getting messed with, I locked up and went to bed again. I left before the sun came up. My four-year-old daughter was supposedly asleep when I heard noises coming from her upstairs bedroom. I tried to listen, but could not make out what was being said. I approached the room, and she stopped talking. Thinking I alarmed her, I went into the room, 
At the time, she was sharing it with her three-year-old sister. I walked in and saw the four-year-old sitting up in bed. I smiled and said, Is everything okay? She said, Fine. But her sister said they were keeping her up. I asked who. My four-year-old said, Sorry, but that she was talking. When I asked her who was talking, my three-year-old sat up and said, The girl in the window. She said you were coming. I asked who the girl was, and they both said a girl comes and stands in front of the window at night and talks to them. Not knowing what to say, I said okay, and tucked them in and hung around outside their door. The next day, I asked about the girl. They said she came back, but was mad. I waited a few days, and then asked again. My four-year-old said that the girl in the window was still mad. I forgot about it for about a week, and then my wife said, Who were the girls talking to upstairs? Freaked out, I ran upstairs, and both girls were sitting under the window, looking up. They turned and looked at me and asked if I wanted to meet the girl. When they turned around, disappointed, they said the girl had left. It has been about five years since, and I have not heard about the girl in the window ever again. When I was about 11, some friends and I were having a slumber party, and we all snuck out of the house in the middle of the night and went to a park about a half a block away. We had been there at least an hour or so, when I thought I saw a large figure about 100 feet away lurking in the shadows under some trees. We all turned to look and stare at the shadow's direction for about five minutes, trying to make it out. Right about when we decided we were seeing things, the figure started running at top speed towards us. We jumped up and ran back to the house as fast as we could go and locked the door. We could hear someone moving around the outside of the house, and then someone began tapping on the windows. We couldn't wake anyone up since we would have to admit that we had snuck out. We spent the night huddled together in the middle of the living room. None of us slept that night. When my cousin was around seven years old, his room was in the basement. The basement level was half underground and half above ground. His room had a window and his bed was right next to the window. One night, out of the blue, he wakes up and opens his eyes, and there's a man crouched right outside the window, staring at him. He didn't know what to do, so he just froze for a second, and then turned over in bed and turned his back to the guy, and eventually fell asleep. Why he didn't run screaming to his parents' room is something that I will never understand. This went on for a while. On random nights, the stranger would come and stare at him through the window. Sometimes he would actually tap on the glass with his finger. On the opposite wall of the window was a mirror. So one night, when my cousin noticed the stranger was there, and he turned over in bed so as to not have to look at the guy, the stranger shined a flashlight and bounced the beam of light into the mirror to illuminate my cousin's face as if to say, I can see you. But the worst part was this. One night the stranger finally got bold and began to push on the window to see if it would open, but luckily the window was locked. To this day, my cousin has no idea who the guy was or what he wanted or what he would have done had the window been unlocked that night.
As an undergraduate at a state university, I got a job on campus as a custodian assistant. The shift was from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. They were good about letting you get your max 20 hours a week, just about any time in between those hours. In theory, we were helping out the full-time state employee custodians, but in practice, once you knew what to do, you were responsible for an area by yourself. Some of the buildings I worked in were kind of old, early 20th century classroom buildings with faculty offices in between. One building had a nice little movie theater dedicated to silent film legend Lillian Gish, who was born nearby. I think film classes would meet there. In the lobby were stills and posters from Lillian Gish's movies. I had to go there pick up and vacuum one night a week in the quiet dark theater at midnight with no one else in the building the old-timey movie stills and posters of the actors wearing the ghoulish carnival of souls pancake makeup kind of creeped me out no big deal just felt a little unnerved with the freaky eyes of the now dead actors looking at me I graduated and a year later returned for graduate school. During the summer semester, I got my old job back and one night I got assigned to clean the building with the theater. Later in the evening, I go to clean the theater. I unlocked the door and saw some of the posters and stills on one wall in the light streaming in through the open doorway. No big deal, just a little creepy. I flipped the switch for the lobby lights and just about had a heart attack when I saw Lillian Gish standing a few feet away from me. It turns out they added a new exhibit while I was away. An incredibly realistic, life-sized wax statue of 90-year-old Lillian Gish. For half a second, I didn't know who was there in the dark or whose embalmed corpse was standing in front of me. So this happened a while back when I was in my early 20s. I was working at a little retail store in my town's mall. It was coming up to the end of half of the day. I don't know how I noticed it, but an older man, probably 50s, I'm not sure, had walked past the store about three or four times, not consecutively, just every now and again. Now, I worked in one of those little costume jewelry stores So it was odd for an older male to be walking past so many times. But I kind of didn't think anything of it. I don't even know how I picked up on it in the first place. It came to closing time and I had left to catch my bus home at about 6.30pm. I remember it was transitioning into winter because it was dark out by then. I'm a very paranoid person. I still live by the stranger danger rules. So even now... When I leave work, I make sure I change into an outfit less fashionable. I don't like drawing attention to myself in any way possible, so I try and make sure I'm as covered up and as average looking as I can be. So, as I said, I was waiting for my bus home, sitting by myself at the town center's bus terminal. And guess who walks past? The older man. At this point, I kind of felt a little uneasy, but in my head, I tried to make reason prevail as many people take buses all the damn time. My bus showed up and I got on, and well, you can guess who got on after me. I remember sitting in the seats facing inward, the ones for wheelchairs and prams, and he sat at the first seat above the steps. I remember staring forward and feeling his eyes burning into me. I kept trying to use my peripheral vision to see If he was looking at me, but not wanting him to know I noticed him, 
The whole bus ride, I waited to see if he got off before my stop, thinking it was just my over-anxious, paranoid mind working overtime, until I pressed the button for my stop. I waited until the last possible second to press it, and as I stood up, he did too. I went to walk to the front door of the bus, and he exited the rear. At that moment, as soon as he stepped off, I sat back down again. I had no idea where the bus went after my stop, but honestly, I didn't care. I will never forget the look on his face as the bus drove off. I have never seen such hate and anger in someone's face than I did through that window. His face is burnt into my memory like a photograph. It still absolutely terrifies me to this day. I have no idea what would have happened to me if I got off that bus at my stop that night, but I am glad my paranoia was so intense that I didn't. In college, I worked security for extra money. One of my regular assignments was the overnight shift at a metal fabrication factory. One of the primary reasons I was there was to ensure that no one broke in to steal all the valuable metal that was stocked on site, which was an occasional problem. That, in turn, involved checking the perimeter fence for damage at least once a shift. That couldn't be done effectively by camera. It instead required physically walking to the fence. So, it was that one night I was walking the perimeter fence in the middle of a thunderstorm. My attention was on the beam of my flashlight illuminating the fence as I walked past. So, I wasn't really focused on where I was walking, despite walking through grass that was a bit over my waist. Apparently, I just stepped awkwardly on a patch of particularly slick grass or mud as I was heading down a hill. But before I knew what was happening, I had slid feet first into an open storm sewer. Some asshole had stolen the manhole cover recently and the edges around the opening were met with rain and mud thanks to the storm. Let me just take a moment to explain this storm sewer. First off, it was shaped just like an oblette. If you're not familiar with what that is, picture a concrete cell that is shaped like a jug. A small opening at the top with sides that slope inward to prevent someone from crawling out. In this case, the bottom was maybe 10 foot square and the opening for the manhole was about twice the normal width of the center of the ceiling. There was no ladder attached and the fall was maybe 20 feet down. At the bottom, the floor was sloped to form two trenches in the shape of a cross. There were sewer channels going off in four directions, but they were only maybe a foot wide across and were blocked with metal grates. At the bottom, there were debris, including a number of large broken pieces of rebar. There were several pieces that were pointing straight up. I definitely would have impaled myself on several jagged points of rusty metal had I hit the bottom, so no way to escape a long fall and a probable disabling injury at the bottom. I somehow caught myself by hooking the edge of the opening on my elbow as I fell in. I dropped my flashlight to the bottom of the pit before I stopped my momentum, so I had a great view of all that broken rebar below me while I was struggling to escape. As I tried to get another handhold, my cell phone skipped out of my pocket and hit the bottom. It felt like forever before I somehow pulled myself out of that opening. I don't doubt adrenaline gave me a considerable boost of strength, but even so, I nearly lost my hold on the edge three times before I managed to scramble out. I was kind of just jerking my knees towards the opening and jumping a couple inches thanks to the momentum. My free hand kept scrambling for something solid to grab, but I never really found anything. I'm honestly not sure how exactly I pulled myself out just using the surface tension between the mud and concrete and my hands and forearm. It felt like a miracle. All I could think of after I pulled myself out was how I wasn't due to be relieved for another seven hours. Seven hours before anyone would even start wondering where I was and that whole time I might have been trapped at the bottom of a pit and paled on some rods of rebar in the rain. I also wanted to kill whoever stole that damn manhole cover.
We moved into a new house a few months ago. As we were in the process of purchasing the house, the renter who was living in it died unexpectedly of natural causes in his mid-40s. He died right in the middle of the living room. Shortly after, we move into the house and almost immediately, our two-year-old daughter starts talking about the ghost that lives in the house. Now let's be real here, she's two, and two-year-olds are very impressionable. Halloween had recently passed, and she had this Halloween-themed picture book that she loved to read, so it's entirely possible that all this talk of ghosts was just coming from looking through a book on a regular basis. Still, she was always telling me that the ghost was in her playhouse in the basement, or that the ghost was on the stairs, or that the ghost was standing in the corner. She never seemed to be afraid of the ghost, and considered him to be a friend. So, I wasn't all that concerned, even if there really was a ghost haunting our house. If he's a nice and helpful ghost, it could certainly be a lot worse. I would often tell the ghost that he was welcome to stay if he wanted to, but he was also welcome to go if that made him happier. I was about 30-70 on the ghost being real and she could see and talk to him versus the ghost being just her imagination fueled by her Halloween books. Until one day, when we were going out to the car to go to daycare in the morning, it was still dark out and rainy. My daughter told me that the ghost was on the back deck, and then she told me that today was the ghost's birthday and she wanted to sing him happy birthday. Once again, I mostly disregarded what she was saying, as she is birthday obsessed and has in the past made us sing happy birthday to Mickey Mouse, a bowl of fruit snacks, and the bathroom. So, we sang and wished the ghost a happy birthday and went on with our lives. Later that day, out of pure curiosity, I looked up the obituary of the man who had died in our house. And wouldn't you know, it was his birthday. A very strange thing happened to my uncle 30-something years ago in a small Colombian town called Oroc. As told by my mother, it's an unbelievable story to the point that I really doubt its occurrence. This uncle, like many of my other uncles, was a doctor. At the time, he was the equivalent of a general practitioner, although he later became a pediatrician. He was young at the time, and was just three years out of medical school. Like many young doctors, he was always eager to prove himself, often at the risk of his own health. This was one of those occasions. After being forced by my grandmother to take a much-needed two-week vacation, he developed a fever. He, being the cocky young man that he was, refused to admit he was sick until he literally fainted while attending a patient. He ends up being hospitalized for three or four days, at which point it seemed he would die. My grandmother, aunt, and mother all traveled to the hospital, which was pretty far away. They took up residence in a nearby hotel. Eventually, my grandmother decides that her son spends his last days with them in the hotel under the care of a nurse. My uncle's quite delirious at this point, so a priest comes, gives him the last rites, and the waiting begins. About a week after the fainting, some of my uncle's colleagues visit him to say their last goodbyes. One of them tells my mother of an unorthodox last-ditch solution. Bring in a medium. Here's where things get really, really weird. This medium was a middle-aged woman who supposedly could channel the spirit of a famous Venezuelan doctor and saint named Jose Gregorio Hernandez, who died in 1919. There were certain things she would need to summon the saint, including a stipulation to leave her alone with the patient, a notepad with a pen, and certain local plants, which were to be collected by her assistant. My grandmother and her daughters were desperate at this point, so they agreed. They leave the medium alone and wait outside for a few hours until the woman emerges. My mother claims that she would hear the voice of an older man murmuring from the inside of the room. The medium comes out and gives them a notepad with a set of instructions. The instructions were for what I suppose could be called a herbal potion. She took no money 
and left after eating a nice meal paid for by my family. Meanwhile, her assistant prepared the potion, which was to be given to my uncle every four hours. Although it took another week, my uncle eventually recovered for the most part, only losing sight in his left eye. He was fired from the hospital he worked at for working with a fever, at which point he left for the capital, Bogota, and began his specialization in pediatric medicine. His brothers, at this point already established doctors, helped him find a new job despite his incredibly irresponsible actions. He retired a few years ago. Is this story true? I, I have no clue, as I didn't even exist. Even as a child, this story seemed extremely unlikely, but there was always something in the way my mom told it that always creeped me out. Like I said before, it's an unbelievable story, the type of story that you'd start laughing at if you saw it on a late night television show. This is something my mother has told me a few times since I was a child, and consistently as well. Did she make it up? Maybe. But I sure as hell didn't. It was winter break, freshman year of college. I drove up to visit one of my friends in northwestern Pennsylvania for New Year's. I needed to be back home for the next day for work, so I decided to drive back at like 2am. I was driving down Interstate 79, and I maybe saw two cars in a 60 mile span. I came up around a bend and saw what looked like a black bear in my lane, and I swerved and went off the road and crashed into the tree line next to the highway. I was in the middle of nowhere and the bear just booked it into the woods. My car was absolutely totaled and I knew I wasn't going to see any cars for hours to help me out. I called 911 and they said they would come in like 20 minutes. I got out of the car and stood up on the shoulder of the highway and waited. After about 5 minutes, I heard some rustling in the bushes and there it was, the bear. Turns out, when I went off the road I hit a cub and mama bear was pissed as hell. I booked it over to the back of the car and hopped in the trunk. Thank God I had a big Ford Expedition so the bear couldn't mess with it too much. For another half an hour, the bear tried ramming the car and was trying to get at me in a frenzy. The police showed up and the siren scared Mama Bear off into the woods again. It was the most terrifying experience of my life. For a brief backstory, I used to work as a fetish model. It's something I did after college that helped pay my bills to supplement my full-time job. It is a unique fetish. It has a rather dedicated fan base, and I had quite a few admirers, many of whom I stayed friends with after I stopped modeling. Many of them are cool people who don't even really bring up my former employment because they respect me and know I am a private person. I rarely had problems, but there was one guy who would just send me harassing messages all the time. They were aggressive and demeaning, and I didn't want that kind of attention. He would then try to be kind for a while, and then be a creep. Bang, blocked him, and I totally forgot about him. He would blow up my phone with calls and texts, also blocked him there. He would message me from other numbers, so I just changed my number. On social media, he would make fake profiles and try to harass me that way. I never add anyone I don't personally know anymore. I just ignore him, just found him annoying and unbalanced, but not a real threat to me. Many years had passed. It had been silence for a very long time, something a couple years. I got a message from a girl wanting to be my friend. I didn't buy it at all because this particular admirer has a very distinct way of writing. Like I said before, very demeaning and demanding, certain phrases, etc. I just ignored the message. I have just started putting myself out there and online dating. I have gone on some lame dates the past couple weeks. I got a match from someone and he sounded pretty nice and friendly. After a few messages back and forth. We agreed to have dinner and traded numbers. I have to say, the beginning of the date was actually really nice. 
My date was very considerate. We had a very easy conversation. After eating and drinking, we left the restaurant to walk back to his place. Even this was pleasant. We get back to his apartment and things are getting hot and heavy. I was really digging this guy until he whispered in my ear. Why did you make me wait for so long? When he said that, my stomach did a little flip. I asked him what he meant. He told me that he had moved all the way from the East Coast for me. My stomach started to drop and I started shaking. It was then that something in his brain flipped like a switch. Instead of the gentleman I was with all evening, he started spewing all of the things of online harassment he would message me. He spewed out details from conversations from like 7 years ago which I had mostly forgotten about and he seemed so angry that I didn't remember all of these things. I was standing there, shocked and topless, realizing what was happening and I noticed that he kept looking behind me. I noticed an open laptop and I am certain that he was recording what was happening. I told him that I didn't feel well and needed to leave as calmly as I could without letting him on that I was terrified. He must have known I was scared though because he grabbed me and wanted me to swear this wouldn't be the last time I see him. I smiled and nodded and offered to go out to dinner another night. I didn't know if just playing it cool was going to work, but very honestly, I was prepared to start fighting if I had to. He relented and let me go to the bathroom to put my skirt back on and I was able to walk back to my car by myself. I just drove in shock and silence the whole way home. He had given me a fake name to go out on this date. He changed his demeanor. He took advantage of the fact that I didn't know what he looked like. I googled his real name when I got home and saw his Facebook page and that confirmed that he was in fact the man that had been harassing me for years. I hadn't even bothered to look at his Facebook page before because I just always ignored him and I, I didn't feel like he was a real threat. I, I feel really stupid. So I immediately blocked the number he had been using for his fake name. I guess I will change my number too since I'm sure he'll just keep calling me. I deleted my dating profile of course. I won't be going out again for a little while. I'm of course going to the police to at least put this guy on their radar. Luckily for me. I didn't mention where I worked specifically, and I didn't mention where I lived specifically either, so I feel pretty good about that. Now that I know what he looks like, I can at least be aware. I feel horrified and stupid that I let myself be so vulnerable. I will say, I am certainly paying attention now. In college, I got into a relationship with a guy. He was fine until he found Jesus. He quickly went crazy, claiming demons spoke to him, trying to buy weapons from some shady friends we had, fantasizing about how he would hurt people, and becoming incredibly controlling and physically abusive, nearly killing me a few times. Needless to say, I got out of that relationship. After a few threats and really crazy behaviors, he left me alone for a while, and I thought that was that. I was heading to my dorm after a meeting one night when I decided to pass it and go to the student union, which was right down the street, to get some ice cream. As I passed the dorm, I heard footsteps behind me. I turned around and I thought I saw someone in a white shirt duck behind a signboard. I kept walking, listening carefully. I heard something move and whipped around again. There. A person his size, staring at me from behind a tree. I couldn't see very well, but it really looked like him. I was mildly freaked out by then, but I just walked a little faster. I'd hear the occasional footsteps and breathing behind me, but I didn't dare to stop or let on that I knew someone, probably him, was there. I knew he owned a gun and would likely put a bullet into me given the chance he was that psycho and upset that I dared to break up with him. I walked all the way to the union and got some ice cream and just sat there in the store eating and willing to go back out into the unlit street in case it was my crazy, armed ex. I still hadn't mustered the nerve to head back when my phone buzzed. 
and my heart just about fell out of my chest when I saw the message. It was some of my friends, a sweet couple. They'd been walking way behind me when they saw something that alarmed them enough to text me. Your ex is walking around the street. They called me before I could even text them back. Where are you? Your ex is prowling around near you. Where are you? Your ex is prowling around here near your dorm. He was coming back from the direction of the Union. I think he had a gun. Was he with you? What's going on? Panicked, I assured them that I had not been with him, but someone who looked like him had been following me, and I was at the Union and was too scared to go back alone. They practically yelled at me to stay there and not to go anywhere, and that they were coming. A few minutes later, they came running into the Union, breathless, eyes wide, asking me why he was by my dorm and what had happened. This was possibly what scared me most of all. The boyfriend, who is a black belt in karate and is never scared, looked absolutely horrified. He was coiled into some kind of fighting stance and looked around wildly, afraid that my ex would appear with his gun. They told me they were taking me back to my dorm and calling the cops. They sandwiched me between them and walked back to my dorm as quickly as we dared. The boyfriend walking in front and yelling into the darkness that my ex better not try anything. I let the two of them into my dorm and we went up to my room where my roommates put in a frantic call to the police. As we peeked out the windows facing the street and side of the dorm, there he was lurking in the trees to the side of the dorm, looking up. A street light reflected something in his hand, something shiny. I saw him tug at the 22 I realized he was carrying and look up. We locked eyes and I saw something, this kind of rage in his eyes that it froze me. In that moment, I knew he really was out to kill me and my friends and I had foiled him this time. He quickly turned and ran away through the trees. We didn't know whether he would come back and try to break in or something, so we called the police again, and lo and behold, sirens within minutes and officers with guns drawn combing the area. They caught him a few hours later, still with the 22 in hand. He confessed he was, indeed, going to try to kill me if he had the chance, but he didn't want to take pot shots at me with friends there. Apparently, since I had broken up with him, I was given over to Satan and he had to take duty to make sure I died and went to hell. Of course, he went to jail and later to a mental hospital and I moved out of the dorm a week later. I just couldn't live with the thought that he could break out and come after me again. I got some cop friends to keep an eye on my roommates until they could move out too. I was never really the same after that. I was afraid and paranoid for years and years. Now, I can be out and about without any fear, but I still have nightmares about him, staring up at me through the trees, gun in hand, and rage in his eyes. Quite a few years ago now, I found myself working at a historical prison museum as a guide slash administrator. This place was one of the oldest buildings in town and had quite the reputation amongst ghost hunters, so it was always spooky working there. The early days had been fairly violent and there had been a few deaths, including state-ordered hangings, so there were plenty of ghostly stories passed around. While I did some very odd things during my time there, the building was old, a haven for local wildlife and far from windproof, so any stories had to be taken with a grain of salt. We also had several dozen mannequins set up in traditional poses, a few gathered in the courtyard, some in the cells, and it was always fun to hear the gasps from the tourists when they saw the first one looming in the hallway. Now, to the story. As this was primarily a tourist town, the winter months were quite quiet, and I could go hours without seeing another person. One day, I had locked out and managed to get a late closing one night and an early morning opening the next day. Both closing and opening required a torch as it was pitch black at this time of year and lights were not installed throughout the entire complex. I only had one tourist the entire day, so to defeat boredom, 
I decided to take one of the surplus mannequins from the storeroom, dressed them up in some early convict ladies garb, and set them up in the kitchen in the ladies wing. I decided I would set them up facing away from the door, holding a bowl in one arm and an egg beater in the other. I made sure everything was very sturdy and closed the kitchen up for the night. The next morning, I arrived at 6am to open up and was making my way through the complex when I heard something strange. The room I was in shared a wall with the kitchens and there was an odd scraping noise coming from the other side of the wall. As I stood there listening in the dark, it stopped, started again, then intensified, accompanied by a tapping noise. A little freaked out, I continued around the building, making my way slowly towards the kitchen. As I stood outside the door, I could hear this irregular noise quite clearly and decided to use the sliding hatch on the door to look into the room first. The mannequin was moving. Not just moving slightly, but quite visibly tapping one foot up and down as it slowly turned the egg beater, its arm raising and lowering. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, my brain started to process what I was seeing. Whether possession or poltergeist, I was not sticking around for this thing to turn around. I slammed that hatch closed and hightailed it back the way I came, not stopping until I reached the main office where I promptly bolted the door and turned on every light I could find. At around 10 a.m., we had our first tourist come through the doors. I had convinced myself by this point that truly what I had seen was some sort of hallucination. I must have heard the building settling and my brain filled in the rest. It, it was dark after all. Knowing I would have to open the kitchen for the tourist to pass through, I hung the back in five minutes sign on the front desk and snuck quietly towards the kitchen door. I slowly opened the hatch and peered in to see the mannequin standing in the same position that I had left it, not moving. With everything back to normal, I breathed a very deep sigh of relief and opened the door. The second I opened the door, the mannequin began to mix the egg beater, frantically tapping its foot. I've never been more terrified than at that moment. It was broad daylight. I couldn't convince myself nothing was happening this time. It was happening right in front of me. I was alone in a museum with a possessed mannequin and I was the only authority figure with an innocent member of the public soon to be coming through this very room. What the hell was I supposed to do in this situation? I remember thinking, it's only plaster and paper mache, just kill it, smash it quickly, run like hell and never come back. As I picked up a meat mallet and walked, extremely hesitantly towards the thing, as I got closer, it began moving quicker until I was with... I picked up the meat mallet and walked extremely hesitantly toward the thing. As I got closer, it began moving quicker until I was within reaching distance, fully expecting this thing to turn around and bury the egg beater in my chest. I grabbed a hold of its arm, only to have the mannequin erupt into a terrible, croaking, hissing noise. I nearly crapped myself at this point, but something about the hissing sounded surprisingly familiar. Gaining some composure, I looked into the bowl the mannequin was holding in its other arm. Looking up at me, with its head stuck firmly between the beater, was a king skink, about 40 centimeters long. I took my hand off the mannequin's arm, and the skink began to run. Stuck as it was, it ran around the circles in the bottom of the bowl, which turned the beater attached to the mannequin's arm, which proceeded to move up and down and caused the whole thing to vibrate tapping its foot on the ground. Five minutes later, I was letting the poor guy go to the courtyard while still giggling hysterically to myself by the end of the day that that mannequin was packed up and back in storage, just in case. In 1993, our family lived in a small town called Ritzville, Washington. I was five years old at the time, and what I experienced has left me thinking about it every single night for the past 22 years. I shared a room and bunk bed with my little brother. The room had a small, fairly deep closet located a few feet from the foot of the bunk bed. Located on the wall was a small vent that, at night, when the living room light was on, would shine through, giving my room a slight ambient glow. Well, one night, I had to go to the bathroom, and when I sat up and was about to take the covers off, I noticed that at the foot of the bunk bed was this tall, black figure 
with a giant oval head that spanned the width of the bunk bed staring at me. It had two small yellow eyes that were far apart, and I noticed this thing stood around six feet tall. Its skin was charcoal and lumpy. I stared at it for a good five seconds before I threw the covers over my head. Five seconds of this monster being ingrained into my head. I could feel the evil surrounding it. I was up for a while before I fell asleep again, so I have no idea how long it was there. In the morning, the first thing I noticed was the closet door. I make it a habit to close the closet doors every night, but it was wide open. My mom was the first to know about it, and you know how most parents kind of wave off their kids' experiences as bad dreams? She didn't. She knew I saw something because they've seen things. I had nightmares for weeks after seeing it. In my dreams, this being picked me up and started torturing me. I haven't seen it since, and I never want to see it again. I'm 22, and this incident happened a year and a half ago. I had just moved into my first apartment and was in the process of moving in. The door that led into my apartment locks itself automatically when closed, so I was going to the entrance of the apartment complex to get my mail while I was talking on the phone with my boyfriend. I returned to my apartment and sat on the bed while opening the mail while using the phone. I dropped the phone on the floor and it landed under the bed so I had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. I saw something that caught my eye. There was someone under my bed. My eyes widened and I choked the urge to scream. The person under my bed was lying still with his back towards me and his head to his chest, so I couldn't see his face, and he didn't see me. Trying to be rational, while so many thoughts rushed through my head, I picked up the phone and said, Sorry, I dropped my phone. I'm just going to take a shower. I'll call you right back. The bathroom is right by my bed, so I hastily walked in, quietly locked the door, turned on the shower, jumped out my window, and called the police. They told me to wait nearby, but to go to across the street and see if anyone comes out of the door to the apartment complex. This was during summer, and it was still light out. I placed myself across the street, hiding behind a car, while watching my open bathroom window and the entry door. I called my boyfriend and he came to me just before the police. I gave them my keys and they went inside. Only moments later, two cops came out holding a thin and tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy but he didn't try to get away. The policeman that had stood beside me and comforted me while the other police searched through my house told me that the man stood outside my bathroom door with one of the kitchen knives, waiting for me to come out. This man had somehow crept into my entry door while I was getting my mail and hid under my bed. The man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was placed in a mental hospital. My boyfriend moved in with me the very next day. This happened six or seven years ago when I was around 13 and still in school. Walking home one day, going through town, the weather was unbearable. Not like that nice sunny vibe sort of warmth, but the horrible bastard heat blanket type that suffocates you. Anyway, I took off some of my school uniform which consisted of a heavy wool blazer, long sleeve grey jumper and tie. This was a mandatory outfit living in Ireland and going to grammar school. Heavy ass coats that people have been wearing since 1667 when the shit first opened. With just a short sleeved shirt on, I headed on my merry way when this old man beckoned me to come over from across the street. He was about 60 or 70 years old from memory with a little driving cap and leather jacket on. Now, this is something that has landed me in trouble before. I cannot simply turn down a conversation. Regardless of when the local junkies approach or clear red flag scenarios unfold, I always entertain the thing unintentionally. So I walk over to this dude thinking, hey, maybe he just needs directions. 
First thing he asks is, Do you want some sweets? And offered a Terry's chocolate orange. When I reached out to take a piece, he just held my hand, like straight up staring into my eyes and held my hand. Rubbing it slowly, he then asked, Would you like to come back to my house for a cup of tea? Surely you must be tired and thirsty. Now, I know the sensible thing to do here was call for an adult seeing as there were hundreds around. Belfast is a busy place. There are also police that often patrol the street. All I had to do was shout or make a scene. Instead, what came out of my mouth was, Nah, dude. Without any resistance, I released myself from his grip, took another piece of chocolate orange and walked back over to my bus stop. Looking over my shoulder, he just stared back at me, mouth open, and after a few seconds hurried off around the corner. I realize now that the smart thing to do was to report him, seeing as this could have happened to anybody else my age, and the man could still be out there. This is the first time I've ever told this story, so nobody else even knows. Although the immediate danger wasn't there, I think the implication warrants a mention. When I was growing up, my older brother raced flat track motorcycles and as a result, my dad and him were gone most weekends during the racing season. Sometimes my mom, my younger sister and myself would tag along but my mom was never really into it so she would keep my sister and me home most of the time and plan fun things for us girls to do during the weekend. This incident happened on one of those weekends where we stayed back in 1987, so I was 10, and my sister was 8. It started out like any other Saturday with my dad and brother gone. My mom took us out to McDonald's, we went to the mall, and then we came home to play Monopoly and watch cable. At around 10pm, my sister and I started to get sleepy. So my mom brought out the sleeping bags for all three of us to sleep together in the living room. I had to ask my mom years later what time this was because, as a kid, I didn't pay attention to the clock so much. So, around 2am, someone starts banging on our front door. Our front door was pretty strange. It had four large panes of glass that weren't opaque, so they were covered with small curtains. We all wake up to this pounding and rush to the door and look out one of the windows and there's this girl at the door. She was probably in her late teens or early 20s, and I remember her wearing a white and blue windbreaker. She's frantic and crying and begging my mom to let her in because she said her boyfriend is chasing her, and she's afraid he's going to kill her. My mom remained calm as hell in a scary situation and said, I'm sorry love, I can't let you in because I've got two young children with me, and I can't risk your boyfriend harming them if he gets in. I can call the police for you if you just stay here. Of course, that didn't sit well with the girl as she started crying more and pointed to her foot that was broken and in a cast. Please ma'am, you have to let me in. He's coming for me. Again, my mom politely refused and turned and ran to the kitchen and called 911. Our phone was mounted on the wall in the kitchen with a ridiculously long cord so she was able to get back to the door while on the phone with dispatch and told her the police were on the way. This made the girl get even more crazy and she said, I don't need the police because I'll be dead before they get here. My mom apologized again and she said she was sorry but she wasn't going to open the door. At this point, the girl just turned around and walked off into the darkness and about 5 or 7 minutes later the police showed up. My mom gives a statement and as she's doing so, my dad and brother come home from the race. My dad didn't even turn off the truck, he just ran up and looked terrified, asking what was going on. While my mom is telling my dad what happened, another officer walked up and said that he didn't see anyone, but found a shoe in the street in front of our house. The police leave and we all sit in the living room for a bit to decompress and I remember thinking that Maybe my mom wasn't being very nice to the girl and should have just let her in. Fast forward to 2001 and it's about a week after I gave birth to my first son. 
Family and friends are at my house and are doting on my baby. After most people leave, there's just my parents, my sister, me, and my son sitting in my living room this time, and I made a comment about how I didn't really love the neighborhood we moved to, but I was proud of actually having my own home with my husband. Then my sister says, Hey mom, remember that lady that came to our door demanding to come in? My mom replied, Yes, very well. At this point, I can tell my mom and dad weren't comfortable talking about it because they gave each other nervous glances. So, my sister, being the asshole that she can be, says, Why didn't you just let her in? I wonder if her boyfriend did end up killing her. My dad interjects and said that my mom did the right thing because it was late and we were home alone. Then he adds this little end to it. Plus, they ended up finding her in a car with her boyfriend smoking dope a few blocks over. They had rope, duct tape, two shovels, and a bunch of knives in the trunk. My sister and I said in unison, What? I asked why we were never told about that, and my dad said they decided not to tell us that we wouldn't feel safe in our own home. Finding this out made me feel like a huge jerk because I had always thought that my mom was being somewhat rude and I always wondered what happened to the girl. Now I know my mom most likely prevented a home invasion with her tough but right decision to deny this girl entry into our home. Learning about that sent chills down my spine. Even writing it out now gives me goosebumps. This happened last summer. We have an old Mercury Grand Marquis that my dad had wanted to buy for years. The owner would never sell it, even though it was just left sitting there most of the time. After he died, his daughter sold it to us for a pretty cheap price because she knew how bad my dad wanted it. So, one day I had to drive it to my friend's house on a rainy day to play some Smash Bros. I left at 10 that night and it had stopped raining and I had to drive my friend home. So, this car's radio didn't work and it would only be static if it was on. Well, I turned down my friend's road and when I turned, I heard someone say, get out. I know it wasn't my friend because he was talking to me. So, we continued the conversation and I got to his house about five minutes later. When we got there, I asked him if he heard something weird when we turned onto the road. He said he heard the same exact thing that I did and I started freaking out. We began wondering if it was the car's original owner telling us to get out of his car. The entire situation was really disturbing. Safe to say I haven't driven that car since. My friends and I were going to a party a few hours out of town, so we decided to stay at her family's vacation house about an hour south of the party. We arrived at the vacation house first to drop off some things. When we left for the party, I spent a moment deciding whether to pull the gate all the way closed. I'd had some trouble opening it earlier when we arrived, and if we were getting home late at night, I didn't want to be stuck outside. I decided to shut it for security. We got back to the vacation house around midnight. When we got there, I saw that the gate was open. I immediately felt on edge because not only did I know I'd locked it, but I knew it couldn't just blow open in the wind. But I didn't want to make a big deal, so I was vague when my friend asked if I had shut it. We went inside and decided to make a snack. I was wandering through the house when suddenly my friend raced from the kitchen to the hallway and virtually tackled me to the ground. She was convinced she heard someone walking around outside. We tried to calm ourselves down, but we had no cell phone reception and there was no one else around. Over the next half an hour or so, we sat in the hallway, paralyzed with fear. We heard footsteps outside. And eventually, someone trying to jimmy open the back door. 
We decided that we had to leave. So we gathered our things and got ready to make a break for the car. And just as we were at the front door, ready to leave, there was a huge bang in the backyard. And suddenly, we heard what sounded like hundreds of birds screaming. It was incredibly terrifying. We sprinted to the car, and as we reversed out of the driveway, we saw somebody running up to the side of the house towards us. We sped the entire way home, and even when we got back to my place, we didn't sleep at all that night. We talked about it many times, and neither of us have ever heard a blood-curdling sound like the one we heard in the back of the vacation house that night. It was truly the stuff of nightmares. <laughs>